So now that we have done a little bit of uh, comparison between the two protocols, let's talk a bit about what we uh, did in terms of our, our head-to-head -head testing here. So our objective was basically to determine the efficiency of lightweight MTM and MQTT clients while simulating a meaningful and realistic IoT deployment. So what we've compared here is we've compared um, basically on a Raspberry Pi as our, as our device. Um, we compared AB Systems Onj uh, library with uh, Lightweight MTM 1.1 support, and we compared that to AWS's IoT, um, their SDK, uh, specifically for Python in this particular instance. And at first, this may not seem like the best apples to apples comparison, um, and we're aware that's because MQTT is probably more from a from a sort of OSI model layer from a technology stack is actually more comparable to to CoAP, which Marcin just did an excellent job describing in detail. Um, but this is not really the way a typical enterprise will make this decision. They're not going to be comparing, contrasting uh, CoAP and MQTT. What they're going to be looking for is to see the sort of overall implementation itself and look for something that's probably a little bit more productized, a little bit more turnkey, um, rather than sort of just taking a raw MQTT broker and building up from there. There certainly are plenty of applications where that is a very valid way to architect, and there are certainly plenty of large enterprises that are working directly with CoAP or directly with MQTT, but that's not the most realistic starting point for most companies. So we wanted to sort of look at an off-the-shelf, uh, as close to off-the-shelf as we can get it, comparison of a reference MQTT solution versus a reference lightweight MTM solution. And Azure would have worked quite well as here as well, um, but we chose to use AWS, um, but the sort of same concepts uh, hold. Um, and let's see, and yep, in terms of the Raspberry Pi, we think it's a good device to sort of just demonstrate um, uh, basic implementation. We know that some customers will be looking at much more uh, low power, more constrained devices, MCUs, or or uh, devices that are using LP WAN or CAD-M or one of these other sort of more um, uh, power efficient or you know remotely managed uh, scenarios. But for our purposes here, we want to sort of just really look at the implementation uh, itself from the, the client side. So um, if we take a look at the next slide. Let's just uh, run through the the tests that we that we conducted, and you can see some of the sort of top line results on the on the right there. So in terms of our specific tests, we looked at um, and basically packet logged and, and captured um, these various scenarios. The first of which is an initial connection. So this is basically like a, a cold start for a device. Um, the device will already have been provisioned with the the appropriate platform. So um, in this case, we actually didn't use Bootstrap, but it would have already been bootstrapped. So this is really just about the sort of, yeah, cold start connection to a platform where it already has uh, been authenticated and enrolled. Uh, the next scenario we looked at was uh, what the steady state device connection looked like. So this would be uh, no active reporting, but sort of heartbeats um, or sort of the, the the quote unquote do nothing stage where the device is sort of sitting around either waiting to accept a command or waiting to send an observation, but not actively sending any uh, any observations northbound. The third scenario we evaluated was uh, the device sending an observation northbound, specifically two updates per minute, so once every 30 seconds. Um, this might seem like a slightly higher refresh frequency for some customers, and for other customers, it may seem like a very low uh, sort of polling or refresh observation frequency. But we think it's sort of representative of the middle of the road, and it's particularly interesting because this is where ultimately many devices will spend the majority of their life cycle. Um, then we looked at a single platform to the device message. And what we really mean here is that this, this could be um, sort of a, a command, you know, to change a reporting frequency or to start initiating a firmware update or to take some action uh, if the IoT device is connected to an actuator of some kind. Um, any sort of platform initiated northbound to southbound message. And this is probably the most isolated pure case of just looking at a single back and forth um, message uh, between the platform and the device. Um, so I think that one's quite interesting. And last but not least, we looked at uh, a variety of OTA firmware update scenarios. 
we looked at um, both, uh, we looked at using lightweight MTM both with HTTPS, so you know, traditional TCP with TLS, as the message, as the, sorry, as the firmware delivery combined with co-app for the sort of command and control of the firmware update process. And we also looked at a scenario where we use lightweight MTM in pure co-app. Um, which is really quite interesting because that's not something that AWS IoT can do or pretty much any MQTT solution can do, uh, which is able to deliver an entire firmware update over the constrained protocol without having to fall back to something like TCP and TLS, which while fine on a Raspberry Pi, um, can be uh, can really introduce some serious overhead if you're dealing with a very constrained MCU or some very low power device. And then we looked at power consumption at, at uh, different reporting intervals to see uh, if we saw any differences in comparisons there. And then um, last, as I said earlier, we looked not just at the technological comparison, but also sort of the business use case comparison. So we did a qualitative evaluation where we looked from, you know, uh, uh, not just the technical perspective, but sort of big picture, we did a business sort of uh, comparison and then a technical comparison at a bit of a higher level as well. And as I said, you can see some of the, the top line results there on the, on the right. But we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into three of these different uh, particular tests that we did. But I encourage you all to download the uh, white paper where we have uh, a lot of data, um, all of the backing for all of this stuff. We have all the graphs and a lot more detailed explanation of the uh, specific scenarios. So with that, let's take a look at the, uh, the first scenario, which I believe is the initial connection. Great. So again, this is um, what we're testing here is the initial connect for a device that was previously onboarded or provisioned. So again, think of it as a cold start. This is also particularly important uh, because if you are bringing a lot of devices online at once, um, if there's a power outage or potentially even after a firmware update um, or some reprovisioning event, this is sort of what you can expect to see. And we, um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned the details, but we basically uh, captured all of the transmission, all the traffic here, and we're comparing both the uh, the total bytes and in some places we'll be comparing the number of packets. So what did we see here? Uh, we saw that Lightweight MTM had 72% less data transfer than MQTT for this boot up event. And you can also see a little bit on the right, um, the difference in the sort of behavior uh, when the devices came online. Um, in particular, one of the um, one of the factors that makes this so uh, heavy in favor of lightweight MTM is it comes back to to what Marcin was saying earlier about the defined data model and those IPSO objects. And one of the advantages of that is that it's a lot it's a lot faster and more efficient to basically say I'm a device and here are the different types of observations that I can send northbound to the platform because it doesn't have to exchange as much overhead in terms of sort of informing the platform of what to expect. Whereas by default in the AWS IoT implementation, and again, this is sort of the out of the box features fully implemented, sort of following their reference documentation about the way that AWS expects you to implement their device shadow features. Um, and obviously you could just use it in raw MQTT if you wanted, but out of the box, the SDK, uh, basically does a, an exchange with the, the shadow service to sort of tell the, the AWS platform what types of data to expect and what the, the shape and schema of that data looks like. And there's a lot of overhead involved in that, in particular because it is JSON. Um, and as Marston said, you don't necessarily have to use JSON as your, your payload within your MQTT packet, but most platforms expect it. And well, that's nice in some ways, since um, you know, I think pretty much anyone who's done this type of engineering work or architecting is very familiar with the, the ubiquity of JSON as the sort of the go-to data interchange format. Um, the issue is not for the issue is it's not very efficient. <laughs> so yes, you can use something else, but if you want to use the built-in AWS IoT rules engine, if you want to use their their thing shadow service, if you want to use, in fact, even their um, they have sort of a, a framework for, for firmware updates and for basically tasks that can be pushed down to the device. You have to exchange all of that in JSON or you have to build your own sort of uh, translation layer and you'd have to run that using Lambda functions or some other system to translate that, that data. So again, you don't necessarily have to use JSON, but um, you sort of do in practice. So let's take a look at another scenario. 
um, which is the uh, the the uh, device observations at a fixed rate. So again, one every 30 seconds, two per minute. And here um, again, we see lightweight MTM has has quite an advantage. And this again really comes back to well, there's a few aspects here, but um, part of it has to do with basically TCP and the acknowledgements that are that are going on. With lightweight M2M, we're using co-op over UDP, so there's actually no need for an act to come back um, every single time the device wants to send an observation northbound to the platform. Now, with MQTT and TCP, you can't avoid that since it is part of TCP. Um, even if you use QoS zero, you can get away with it to a certain degree, but you still have to deal with the TCP act um, and by default, again, the AWS IT implementation, why you could change this, there's also this uh, shadow update confirmation process when you send a uh, sort of state update to the platform. Now, you could probably reduce the overhead in terms of bytes to a certain degree if you were not using the shadow update service and you were talking directly to AWS IoT and ingesting it with you know, whatever services you have on the other end and then feeding it into your, your platform, your data model, or what have you. Um, but we're trying to compare sort of out of the box functionality. And it's also important to note here that on the lightweight MTEM side, you can configure that kind of ACK behavior over CoAP and UDP if you so desire. Um, so if you want to make sure that every single message has this you know, declarative, okay, uh, you know, device sends a message to the platform, platform can acknowledge and send back to the device to say it got it, but you don't actually have to. And by default, that's actually not enabled. And that's why we see such a large, large delta here. So it's both the differences in the underlying transport protocol, differences in the default implementation, and uh, just the inefficiencies of, of JSON in this particular case. All right, let's take a look at uh, one more scenario. And again, there's a lot more information around this um, in the white paper. So I know if you're trying to extrapolate a little bit further, or you want to see a little bit more detail, we have, uh, I think, four or five graphs for each one of these topics um, in the white paper. Um, so this is another interesting one, which is the single platform to device message. So as I previously mentioned, this would be something like the platform telling the device to change its reporting interval, maybe to start a firmware update, to do some action. Um, and here we see, you know, it, at its sort of core, the most um, the most limited, or I should say, the most uh, pared down comparison, and that there's very little overhead for either one of these protocols uh, for this kind of message, which is why I think it's interesting because this is probably one of the sort of purest comparisons of the underlying uh, protocols rather than the out of the box implementations, and both are important. You know, obviously, we, we want to understand more about the differences between lightweight M10 and MQTT, but looking at a major cloud vendor like AWS, you know, I think it's important also to see their, their default out-of-the-box implementation since many customers, especially those who don't maybe have a lot of strong domain expertise in IoT, they're going to tend to trust their platform vendor and tend to configure things out of the box in the sort of reference manner that the platform vendor provides. So unlike those cases, here we see a smaller difference because this is really um, just a single message, but even here, uh, we do see the increased efficiency that Lightweight MTEM has to offer. This is largely down to the encoding scheme. Um, I think it's it's interesting, and one other thing that's, uh, it, we, we talk about it again in much more detail in the white paper, but it's very worth noting here, since this graph does, does show it, we have a few others that I think describe this a little bit better, but the point is still here, which is if we look at the, the packet size or the packet length in the bottom right there, you can see that there is a variability to the MQTT packet length, packet size. And while you have to take my word for it or, or look at the other graphs to, to see this elsewhere, this is very true across all of our tests, even when we're sending thousands or tens of thousands of packets. Uh, lightweight MTEM is very predictable in that you know exactly what that packet length is going to be in, in general, which may not be so much important for you know uh, an industrial gateway that's connected in a you know in a factory it's connected to a gigabit network to fiber or they probably have local fiber backhaul you know we may not care about that as much but when we think about power constrained devices wireless devices devices that have very limited uh you know uh 
both CPU power, but also you know battery life, um, it can be very useful to have a predictable packet length because it allows you to optimize your network layer much, much more uh, with much more granular control than you would otherwise with something like MQTT over TCP. So if you're in an environment where you really need to control everything, where you want to get maximum efficiency out of your radio time so that you're not spinning it up and you don't need to get everything, you know, the, the sort of race to sleep kind of scenario, um, there's a huge advantage here to, to using lightweight M10 with co-op.